This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Giving the public an inside look at how police make those life or death decisions. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around. We'll take you inside the Charlotte Police Training Academy's Transparency Workshop coming up. No one likes going to the dentist, right? Well, this is a room full of children who are having their teeth cleaned, having cavities filled, even having teeth pulled, and they're having a little bit of fun. Plus, it's free. I'm Suzanne Stevens. Coming up, we'll look at who's paying for all this and why. And ready to race? Well, get suited up because we're checking out a place known for indoor karting fun. Please don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Are the police biased? Are they too quick to use deadly force? Well, it all depends on who's asking. These kinds of questions get asked a lot more here in Charlotte ever since that week of police protests last September. Well, now the cops are offering the public some answers and a chance to see for themselves how officers train to make those hard decisions that affect all of us. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier joins us now from the Charlotte Police Training Academy with more. Yeah, Amy, out here on Shopton Road, well, this is where the police train their new officers and retrain their veteran officers. But now the Police Training Academy is opening its doors to the public for what they call transparency workshops. It's a chance for regular citizens like you and me to see what the police see before they make some of those life or death decisions that have become so controversial here in Charlotte. And allow me to present to you the 175th recruit class of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. That I will support and maintain. They're the first class of Charlotte police recruits who saw this. But they still signed up anyway. That I will be alert and vigilant. I couldn't help but to notice the fear in the posture, the uncertainty on their faces. That I will faithfully and impartially. These newest Charlotte cops to be sworn in, more likely than ever to be sworn at. A cell phone. He better not be dead. He better not be dead. As they saw last fall, we were challenged as an organization and a city. Shots fired, shots fired. I can't promise you you're not going to have some hard times in this profession. Because I'm not going to lie to you. And when they walk through the dark, scary, lonely places, remind them that you are there to protect them and to lead them. But most of all, thank you, Father, that as they walk out of this place, your presence goes with them today. But while this graduating class of police figures out on the fly this changing world of body cams and Black Lives Matter, well, the cops are changing too. Show me where, ma'am. Show me where. Show no, me where. this isn't a police video. It's me in a police simulator, the same one that trains real officers who to shoot and when to shoot. Charlotte police, come on. Charlotte police, come on. The guns are modified, but they're real too, and so are the situations. You're not going anywhere. Oh, yeah. Sir, put down the gun. 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 Don't let me have you. Put down the gun! The police simulator shows that the decision to shoot or not to shoot is hard. And so are the questions afterward. All right. Tell me what she was saying to him when you turned the corner. I don't remember. I checked the, uh, the registration. In this transparency workshop training exercise, I play the cop in a traffic stop. The cop plays the driver who's pulled over. And there's a gun in plain sight on the dashboard that I never saw until it was too late. So I can confirm that you do have a license even though you don't have it with you. I mean, I don't see what the problem is, officer. For the citizens that sit in this seat, when we do ask them to 
please put your hands on the steering wheel. We want them to sit in our seat and see just how difficult these are for us to navigate. This is our action versus reaction drill. The police transparency instructors also demonstrate how long it takes police to react so and shoot back. Guy, keep your finger off the trigger, uh -huh. keeping alongside the frame of the weapon. Right. You go point it straight at the center line of the officer. Go ahead and point. Okay. And you're just going to hold it there. Uh -huh. Okay. When you're only this far away from someone else with a gun, someone you're trying to talk to, who instead starts shooting at you. So, as soon as you see his hand raised. You fire. All right? In play. Stop. In slow motion, you can see what happened. Even though I'm pointing my gun right at him, the training officer raises his gun and fires at least twice before I finally get off my first shot. This is the way your shield was right here. Okay. Wow. Yep, and, and look wow. at these hits. These right here are our hits that we usually train at. And only one of those, yeah. I mean. Now look at now look at these. Because us reacting is gonna take much longer than the action of an, another person. That's a hard thing to explain, but an easier thing to experience. And that's exactly why we do it. Right. Exactly why we do it. We want them to come in here and see. Recruit class 175. You may now pin your badge. What police hope is that seeing is believing. That seeing into how cops train and what they deal with will help their critics believe that the police really are here to protect and serve. To the families, thank you so much. You made them good people. Now we're going to make them good police officers, good cops. The Training Academy adds that uh, there are no limits on how many workshops they'll schedule or how many citizens can sign up. But so far, only about 70 have actually taken the transparency workshop. Kind of surprising given all the controversy that Charlotte Police have been involved in recently. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. Joining me now is Charlotte Police Chief Kerr Putney. Chief Putney, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was eye-opening to see that opportunity for the average Joe to see what it's like to train to be on the police force rather with you. Sure. Why are you doing more of these? Well, first of all, we want to be open and honest, uh, and we want to allow the public to have an opportunity to stand in our shoes, but also we want them to show us our blind spots. We know what we do and why we do it, but it's most important that the community gets that understanding and then gives us the feedback on how we can do it better. Having been through what we were through in the fall in this community, what are some of the lessons that we learned to help prepare us, heaven forbid, if there are any issues of that magnitude in the future? A lot of, a lot of takeaways. Um, the big one for us, though, is uh, the need to be more um, aware and um, proactive in the area of social media, uh, to also know how to quickly respond to issues. I think um, we were traditionally going by about our business as we always do, and uh, I think that therein lies one of the issues. We were missing and, and were disconnected from a younger group that we actually have to talk to more. And uh, since last September, we've done a, a much better job of it. Let's Out of that came the transparency workshops, as a matter of fact. Let's talk a little more about social media. It has its pros and it has its cons. How do you deal with that? Because everything is immediate these days. You gotta be proactive. You gotta connect with people who have networks that can actually help you get facts out to people who ordinarily wouldn't listen to you. We saw that we were connected uh, through, through tradi traditional means to a lot of people, but the non-traditional uh, social media means now were better because we have people who can speak for us once we give them the facts, and it's a lot uh, more timely. As a leader, is it difficult for you having the long history here in Charlotte because everyone has, you know, people around you have sort of watched you grow up, sure. so to speak, in the force, but to have to take the, make those difficult decisions in the time of crisis, how, how hard was that for you? It's a double-edged sword. I think it was beneficial because people know me, they know where I'm coming from, um, but it's difficult because uh, familiarity breeds some, some content, sometimes some contempt, and we have to make sure that we're being true to everything that we say, and uh, people rally around that, but also that you're taking care of people. Uh, we, we had a lot of uh, um, challenges. Our officers faced a lot, and uh, I tried to make as many roll calls out there, especially to our civil uh, emergency unit, 
to keep their spirits lifted, and the community did that uh, amazingly. They provided water, food, um, snacks, and uh, letters, um, cards, just to show that they were supportive and, and that the uh, community had the officers back. So I think that went a long way. So growing up in their community helps, gives you some credibility, but being able to tap into that spirit in the community, that supportive spirit, I think, um, really lifted the spirits of our officers and, and got us through a difficult time. How long will these opportunities for the public to participate in, in the training take place? Uh, we're gonna do them until the, there's no need. I think we would, this is a, the beginning of a journey for us uh, with our community. Uh, we wanna be as open and honest as we can, but we also wanna hear that feedback. So we've heard it for a quarter now. We're gonna uh, sit back and assess, fine tune our message, and continue to give the uh, public and the community what they wanna see and what they wanna experience and learn from uh, those experiences as well. Has it been difficult to recruit new officers because of all of this? Um, because of this, this environment um, has been changing over the last three years or so. And we've seen our numbers um, drop uh, quite significantly over the last three years. So yes, it hurts. Um, I think uh, as a profession, we own our history, we have to. It's not uh, a very pleasant history at times. Sometimes it's very discriminatory, uh, especially towards people of color. Uh, but now we have an opportunity to chart a path forward together. I've seen more collaborative work in Charlotte over the last four or five months than I've seen in a long time. And I always say, if we don't take opportunity from something so tragic, to make Charlotte better than shame on us. Any next steps? What else do you see needs to be done in our community? Uh, right now, we gotta continue to connect. We gotta connect with our younger people, as I said before, millennials in, uh, in particular. Uh, we gotta change the narrative so that uh, people see a sense of hope and a brighter future. Um, you know, you saw the Opportunity Task Force recommendations. They dovetail right into a lot of the work that we've been trying to do and need to do even better in the future. Um, I think some of the next steps are to collaborate with those kinds of partners so that we can give more uh, people hope. I think what we saw last um, fall was just uh, an outpouring of emotion around disenfranchisement. We gotta, we gotta turn that tide, we gotta turn that around. Charlotte Police Chief Kerr Putney, thank you for your service, thank you for the, uh, the service of all of your team, and uh, we appreciate what you do for all of us so much. On behalf of the CMPD family, I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, quick. What's the number one disease among children in North Carolina? I bet you'll be surprised to find out it's tooth decay, and it can cause children to do poorly in school. Recently, a group of dentists, hygienists, and volunteers swooped into Charlotte to give several hundred students free dental care. Carolina Impact's Suzanne Stevens takes us to the event. Every year, volunteers convert the gym at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church into a makeshift dental clinic. Hundreds of children get out of school for a day, yay, to go to the dentist, yay again. We're gonna work up here in this area here, okay? I feel numb, what about back here? Students like Lawanda, who's having six cavities filled. I want you to do is make sure you're brushing and flossing every night. Okay? Dr. Robert Young tells Lawanda something she may have never heard before. So what I want you to do is be careful about what you drink as well, okay? I don't want you drinking sodas as frequently. Okay, Dr. Young gave up a day at his practice to be here. He expects to treat a lot of tooth decay. If we can eradicate that or minimize it to some degree, the kids will not miss school as frequently, and then hopefully grades and everything else go up. A national nonprofit group called Team Smiles brought in most of the major dental equipment, like the portable dental chairs. This gadget is actually a portable x-ray device, and doctors read the x-rays here. Volunteers can sterilize equipment here so it can be used on as many children as possible. These students were specifically chosen by their school nurses because, frankly, they needed dental care and their families can't afford it. More than half of them are sponsored by Project Lift, which is a private effort to help lower income students get ahead. Dr. Matt Leinberger helped coordinate getting local dentists to take part. So today is all about getting as much real dentistry done as we can for these kids. Extractions, fillings, you know, cleanings obviously, stuff like that, but really getting some of the hard work done. There is an urgency here because this is the first time many of these children have ever seen a dentist. So back to the yay factor. Look, there's Sir Purr. The Carolina Panthers also sponsored this. The team's dentist says he wants to encourage kids not to be afraid. 
If we can help with that and, and make this a great experience versus another trip to the dentist, that's, uh, that's what we're hoping to change attitudes and change habits. Studies show that one in four children in North Carolina public schools misses school for no other reason than dental pain. And a child with a toothache is four times more likely to have a low grade point average. That's why all this is so important. Of course, children can't concentrate when they're in pain. They can't eat, they can't concentrate, and then there's the social stigma. A hygienist for Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, so Peggy Rolleder, has seen it all. I have on many occasions had the teachers say, I wonder if that's why she doesn't eat her lunch. And in most cases, it's true. That's why they're not eating, because they're not able to. There are a number of reasons why children can't get good dental care. Some don't have dental insurance at all. For those who do, their families may not be able to pay the amount insurance doesn't cover. Getting transportation to the dentist also poses a problem. And parents' attitudes, they don't want to treat baby teeth. Each of the students here is actually screened twice at school, once in kindergarten and again in third grade. But that's it. And that may be the last time a dental professional takes a look inside. So this clinic tries to cover everything, from taking care of the big problems to showing kids the importance of brushing and flossing every day. Remember what I told you about making sure you're brushing, you know, every night, okay? It takes about 50 dentists and professionals to make this happen, and this is the third year Team Smiles has chosen Charlotte. Because the dental needs here are so great, organizers intend to come back again next year. For Carolina Impact, I'm Suzanne Stevens reporting. Thanks so much, Suzanne. A total of 185 students received free dental care and education at this year's event. Well, during the last four years, more than 1,300 students have been helped. Well, fast food restaurants are all over the place. Burgers, fried chicken, subs, they're everywhere. But one thing you don't see often is fast food barbecue. One Charlotte landmark is the exception. In tonight's Carolina Cooking segment, Jason Turzis takes us to the barbecue king, where for nearly 60 years, they've been serving up traditional barbecue, along with a unique item you likely won't find anywhere else. It opened nearly 60 years ago. It was just a gathering place. Regulars have been coming in for years, decades in fact. I've been coming to Barbecue King 30 plus years. They come for the food. The best barbecue in Charlotte. The friendly service. The service has always been great. And that feeling of yesteryear. We drive over an hour to get here. It's just a nostalgic drive-in, you know, with, that you don't see a lot of that around here anymore either. No wonder this place has stood the test of time. The Barbecue King on Wilkinson Boulevard in Charlotte opened in 1959. Here they've been dishing up everything from pulled pork to barbecue fried chicken to homemade onion rings and hush puppies. And it's all brought to your car, old school drive-in style. You just don't see those types of things anymore. Back in the 50s and 60s, it's how a lot of places operated. We had Westover drive-in, we had town and country drive-in down here, and we just cut you just cruising, cruising on Friday and Saturday night. While others have closed up over the years, the Barbecue King has survived, thanks to a few main reasons. First and foremost, the food. I think that's one of the key ingredients to uh, running a business for such a long time is to have consistency of the food and the service. Whether you came to the Barbecue King back in the day or today, you'll notice that not much has changed from the look of it outside to the call boxes where customers place orders, to the way the food is prepared. Whether it's the slaw or the onion rings or the tartar sauce or the homemade chili, it's the same recipes that have been here for many, many years from, from really day one. Everything here is made in-house, with the exception of the french fries. Today's menu looks almost identical to the one first used in 1959. The barbecue plate, which sold back then for a dollar, is now $7.95. And the barbecue chicken, which used to be just 80 cents, is now $6.95. But what the Barbecue King might be best known for actually isn't their barbecue. It's their barbecue fried chicken. We take fried chicken, southern fried chicken, and we dip it into our original barbecue sauce that we've been making since 1959. The item was so unique and so popular that Guy Fieri featured it on the Food Network's diners, drive-ins, and dives. People, once they saw the show, people came from everywhere. California, uh, Alaska, 
uh, they came from L Las Vegas everywhere to try the barbecue fried chicken. While out of towners are certainly welcome, it's the regulars who keep this place going. I usually always get the mince barbecue sandwich with onion rings and a sun drop and a hot dog every single time. <laughs> well, the poor boys and the barbecue plates <laughs> is my favorite. They laugh at me here because I only order two things. I either order the uh, quarter fried chicken, white meat and onion rings, or I order a sliced barbecue sandwich and onion rings. Onion rings a must and a cherry lemon sun drop. Must have. Brothers George and Gus Carapano send their uncle Steve own, manage, and cook at the Barbecue King, along with help from Steve's wife Maria and George's daughter Amanda. But they might not be the most popular people here. How y'all doing today? That honor goes to the Barbecue King's red jacket wearing car hops. Thomas Curitan has been serving customers curbside for 40 years. David Anthony, 35 years. That's a combined three quarters of a century. These guys are just as consistent as the food itself. The car hops always, they're always good. They're glad to oblige you, anything you need. You get paid every day, you're a curve guy. You get to meet people. The pay is good, the people is good. It's an addiction, it's like it's an adrenaline that you deal with on a daily basis. I like the job, I love the job. The customers, I love them to death. They love me too. Thomas has been working here 35, 40 years. He'll come out the car, brings me my extra ketchup that I need. He, he knows what I like. and. Uh, don't have to ask, and it, it just automatically get uh, get the service you want. People come out here, I walk out the door, service somebody else, and I ain't even see them pull up yet. And they haul in my name and stuff. You know, we waiting on you. We waiting on you. Some of the regulars here have been coming in for decades, many since childhood. It's what I grew up in. You know, what I grew up coming to, and it's just every time I come back here, it's like going back to my childhood. You know, it's kind of like brings back memories. My dad used to send me here every Friday night pick up a to-go order for the family. What's amazing about the Barbecue King is it's achieved all its success with little to no advertising. It's all been word of mouth, and apparently a lot of people have been doing a lot of talking over the years. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Churzis reporting. Yum, Jason always makes me hungry with his stories. The Barbecue King is in West Charlotte on Wilkinson Boulevard. Well, are you an adrenaline junkie with a need for speed? Over at Victory Lane Indoor Karting Center in Charlotte, there's a racing league that meets once a month to have a little fun and do a little good. Carolina Impact's producer, John Branscombe, introduces us to the Golden Benny Karting League. Reluctantly crouched at the starting line, engines pumping and thumping in time. The green light flashes, the flags go up churning and burning they yearn for the cup it's racing it's friendship and muscle for rank fuel burning fast on an empty tank it's always just been a small group of race enthusiasts we've had people from from race teams we've had cup drivers come we've had guys in banking industries my name is darren crane i'm an it professional uh, i'm a nerd i sit in front of a computer all day long my name is hans sonneson i'm the general manager here at victory lane indoor Curry. My name is Paul and I'm just a regular racer. It's the closest thing to Formula One. <laughs> That's what I was told. Oh, I call it my old man fun. <laughs> I'm 65 years old and I'm, it's the best thing I do for being this old. Best things I can say about Paul? Paul's fast when he wants to be. <laughs> we supply the cart, the helmet. We got a uh, full race suit so you can wear it to cover up if you need to. There are almost 2,000 feet of track. We're getting them up to probably about 30, 35. These corners happen so fast, you don't even have a think, chance to think about the last corner. And if you want to pass somebody, you have to think three corners ahead. We put them out on the track for a 32-minute race. They switch drivers every eight minutes. It's a lot of thinking all at once. It, it happens real fast and we switch up the teams, we change drivers, nobody can have the same teammate, nobody can have the same go-kart, and then we take them out for an hour-long race. It's the best part about this format here. We, we choose different partners for every race. So uh, over a period of 10 years, I've raced with everyone. You know, you can't hold grudges, you gotta be friends with everybody. What is the gold Benny? Hilarious. Uh, the trophy is uh, very special, very memorable. You can't describe it in three or four words. Wow. Uh, the Golden Bennett Trophy is uh, atrocious. <laughs> it's grown over the years to be enormous. 
uh, you know, the rule everyone adds something every month uh, adds up. Whenever I win it, I take it to my office and I make everyone in my office salute it for a month. And then I bring it back. We take a flat fee of $50 to race for the track. That covers the racing. And then the league, we, we take $15 from everybody that comes. And we take that to pay for food. And the rest, we donate straight to charity. Hope Match is the name of the charity. Last year we gave $2,200 and we were able to help eight families. It's important to give back. It just makes you feel good as a person. Me, I guess, knowing that at the end of the year, uh, I had a good time. I enjoyed racing with these guys and we were able to accumulate all that money that we can give back to somebody that is less fortunate than us. So it's all about helping out our fellow man, really. I'm telling you, it looks like a lot of fun to me. We appreciate that story, John. My husband and son have been there and they loved it. Next time, they've got to take me. Well, for more details about Victory Lane or the Golden Benny Karting League, we've got a link posted along with this story on the Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Before we go tonight, we want to invite you to like us on Facebook, please. You'll get to see previews of upcoming Carolina Impact segments, as well as previews and behind-the-scenes segments from some of your favorite national shows. Well, that does it for us this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.